Hi, this is David Olavsky, and welcome to the Rabbi Olavsky Show. And uh, whether you're watching with our friends over at Tony Time, hi friends, or you, uh, whether you listen or watch your podcasts, um, it's always exciting to have you along for this experience because we are a community. I say this all the time, but I just got this email I had to share with you. Rabbi Olavsky crazies are everywhere. On visiting day, we discovered that my son's second cousin was in his bunk. The counselor told me that it's crazy how boys don't talk to each other. He then drops his voice and says, I don't want to get into trouble by saying something goyish, but you know how two men can sit together watching a football game for two hours and never... Rabbi Olavsky interrupted? He was so excited to realize that we were both crazies. <laughs> Givaldic, isn't that great? Isn't that great that uh, that we we I'm 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 in this with everybody else. I'm just I'm just one of the crowd, you know. Um, and uh, it's so exciting to know that we're part of something this dynamic. And uh, we have a sponsor uh, for this episode, sponsored by the Safran family, the Eloy Nishmas from Moshe Shmuel Ben Zev Safran, whose yard site is Chaf Tes Tamuz. And uh, the neshama should have an aliyah, and the family should have bracha and hatzlacha and all good things. It's a big schus that she's doing to be able to be mefarsim uh, this uh, the messages we speak about. And uh, and I want to say a Torah thought, but obviously <laughs> this is the Rabbi Olavsky show, so it's going to take me a while to get there. But there is a there is. Uh, is a madness to my method. So, wait, reverse that. Yeah, there is a method to my madness. <laughs> so I'll tell you a story. Um, I was Long Island director of NCS Wife for nine years, and uh, basically there are chapters. Chapters are like youth groups, usually in shuls, and they get together to form regions. So I got started in the West Coast region. And then I became regional director of the Long Island region. Um, I took the job, and then I looked for the regional office. There was no regional office. I looked to find an events calendar. There hadn't been any events for two years. It was, it was really, it was dead in the water. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I was really surprised because I was coming from the West Coast. They had a big office on Wilshire Boulevard, and I was. Region was made up of seven states and two provinces. It was really very exciting, you know. For um, winter uh, seminar, we went to San Francisco for the uh, for the uh, spring uh, convention. We went to Seattle, Washington. We were in L.A. You know, it was very exciting. It was very dynamic. And here I am with with nothing. There was one member because uh, she she had to be part of her region, and <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> yeah, you know, and they gave me very little money to work with. Yeah, but um, but they told me that uh, uh, you know, look, it's not a lot of money, but you know, you only have one member, so considering that, it's a lot. You know, <laughs> I said, oh, that's great. We've really set the bar pretty low. If I get one more kid, I've doubled. <laughs> but when I was out in L.A., um. I was tricked into taking uh, an NCSY chapter. And so the first thing I did is I went to the regional office. I had no idea what NCSY was. And I read everything I could find, every pamphlet, every brochure, every, you know, periodical. Now, I didn't know that nobody does this. Yeah? Most people who get involved in NCSY do it the same way that we learned how to play Risk in our house. You know, we started reading some of the rules and we said, no, nah, forget about it. We'll just make it up as we go along. <laughs> And I have to tell you, we have a much more exciting game of risk than other people do, because when you actually play by the rules, it's pretty dull. So uh, we livened it up a bit, because we just played it by ear, you know, we'll figure it out as we go along, you know. Yeah, Beseder, you know, you know that expression here in Israel? Yeah, it'll be okay, you'll see. So um, I didn't know that, so I had no idea what I was doing, I had nobody to talk to. So I spent an enormous amount of time reading up on it, and I found out that after this process, I was the second most knowledgeable person about West Coast NCSY. First was Lee Sampson, who founded the region, and then me. <laughs> so, 
uh, I had, I had, I knew history, background, all kinds of stuff. Nobody knew this stuff because I would just, you know, more or less made it up as they went along. Yeah. So, um, uh, but one of the things that every region has to have is a regional song. So I come to Long Island and I do the same thing. I start try to find old files that used to be in office one someplace else. I took them, I read through, I spoke to people, I tried to get it down. And one thing is, it had been around for six years, theoretically. They had one director the first year, one director the second year, and then another director for the third and fourth year, and then they went through five directors the next two years. Which does not help your position. <laughs> so I was, I was uh, coming in in year seven, but there was nothing there. We were, you know. So I, I said, they must have had a regional song someplace. So someone says to me, yeah. I said, how's it go? He says, it goes like this. Na, 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 na. I said, there are no words. They said, wait. Na, 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 na. I said, there's still no words. They said, Wait. Na 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 I said, that's the regional song. So that's the only part anybody knows. <laughs> there must be more words to it, but this is the only part that anyone knows. So they play the whole song for like four minutes, and then everyone goes, Ma, 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 Lot, because it was the Ma Lot region. Yeah. So I searched through the files, I found the words. <laughs> I understand why nobody sang this. I think I may be the only person who knows the words, because I think I met the guy who wrote the song. He doesn't remember the words either. Rising together, united is our cue. Reaching for the only one, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Never forgetting, we must always learn. To know the Torah is our greatest yearn. From the time of Mitzrayim to this very day, performing the mitzvos each and every way, never forgetting, um, we have to, da, 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 I forgot the words there. Ah, we are ma'alot, up the madre goat, higher and higher to the veikut. Ah, ma, ma, ma'alot, to be ma'alot, only through mitzvot. Can we remember a great Kiddush Hashem from the time of... Okay. So the only point anyone knew was, Ma, Ma, Ma! <laughs> I wrote a new regional song. And, uh, um, but uh, every region had a regional song. And that was uh, what it was all about. So I don't know how it came up recently, but I mentioned um, Midwest region had a song. I don't know the first part, because that wasn't the part that everybody sang. You know, it was their version of Ma, 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 Lot, right? So, um, uh, uh, it goes like this, all right? This is the chorus part of it. Cause I'm feeling good about Yiddish kite. With Achtos, we can win the fight. The Torah is alive, we must survive till Mashiach does arrive. Cause I'm feeling good about Yiddish guy. Now, this is an amazing thing because you're in the Midwest and you have all these kids like from farms and stuff like that. You, have, you know, country, I'm a country boy by, uh, by A.B. Rattenberg and Vegas. You know, that, that, those are the people who came. The whole bunch of public school kids, they're all going, I'm feeling good about Yiddish guy. <laughs> but that's not the part that I, I wanted to focus on. <laughs> I'm feeling good about Yiddishkeit. With Achtus, we will win the fight. I don't know if people who make up these words really give a lot of thought to it. Yeah. Um, sometimes people put in words and, you know, when you have to rhyme, yearn, and learn, you know, that you're stretching, you know. <laughs> I have to just say this for a moment because, you know, I've had this chus to have a 
Kesha with A.B. Rottenberg for almost 40 years. And that his music is so brilliant, Madach. There are other people who can write brilliant music. I, his has this particular time to it. But he has a gift for lyricists, as a lyricist. Let's try that in English. <clears throat> but he has a gift as a lyricist that he finds words that are amazing. And that's why if you listen to country, I'm a country boy. Yeah, there are words there that you wouldn't find except in country western music. You know, if we keep ourselves pristine. <laughs> No one uses the word pristine. You know, it's like, that's a country western word, you know? So, uh, he, he had a, an unbelievable way. So, his, his words were always very gechejbend. Yeah. Um, I don't know that every regional director who either made up the words or got someone to make up the words put that much thought into it. And most of these have never really survived as classics. <laughs> but, um, uh, but that phrase, with Achtus, yeah, we will be successful. We will manage. What does that mean? So if you remember when I spoke about Shavasa Batamas, I spoke about the power of breaking. Now, Shavasa Batamas is all about breaking and breaking things down. And that's really part of a process. Because we break down the walls of Yushalayim, and on Tisha B'Av, we actually destroy the base of Mikdash. And Klai Yisrael goes into Gullus. What does it mean when you're in Gullus? It means you're not where you belong. And it's an amazing thing. We, for the most part, haven't experienced this. All right? Not since World War II. Uh, I, I shouldn't say that in the, in the, in the Svarti countries, they experienced this in, in 1948 and around that time, of just being thrown out of your homes. To a certain extent, right, we understand this, the people who built the communities in Gaza experienced this. They were literally thrown out of their house. And people don't always appreciate what they're doing. When, when uh, Sharon originally announced the date for the uh, Hitnat Kut, the way that they called it, the uh, Gerush, is the way the people who lived there referred to it, the expulsion. They picked as the date, they picked the secular date. It turned out it was Tishbav. I guess they realized the optics of throwing a bunch of Jews out of their house on Tishbav. <laughs> it's like in Israel, like, you know, probably wouldn't go over so well. <laughs> I think you have, to have, you have to have a certain modicum of, of sensitivity, you know. So uh, um, that's why when, when we have days for commemorations, they're always significant. And that's why the fact that the State of Israel chose as Yom HaShoah a day in Nisan when it's forbidden to have any public mourning is one of the reasons that you find that, that there are people who have mixed feelings towards that celebration. So timing is really very important. And uh, the fact that Tisha B'Av is the day of destruction and exile. So how many people are kicked out of their community? Yeah, neighborhoods change and you have to relocate and businesses change and things like that. There was a time in America where there were so many small towns that had a shul, an Orthodox shul, and a Jewish community and things like that. It's all gone now. There's nothing. There's remnants. You can go through places in Brooklyn, East New York, and, uh, and Brownsville, and, and you see these big churches. And if you look at them, you can see Mug and David and, and the stained glass windows. Uh, changed. Uh, you can go to places in the Muslim quarter and see in the doorway where there was a mezuzah. Uh, okay, things change, things change, people move. But, but the expulsion, so you take the, the Jews and you say, out, everyone leave. What they today call pro population transfer. It's, uh, um, it's an amazing thing, just take all your stuff and go. So, um, so 
the idea of being in exile means we're not where we belong. Now, I live in Eretz Shell. August will be 34 years that I'm living here in Eretz Shell. But there's no base in Mikdash. And if there's no base in Mikdash, then Eretz Shell is not Eretz Shell. In order to be able to be the place that it's supposed to be, with the Hashra Sashchina, the place where, as it says, Hashem is watching it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. That constant sense of, of God being in the land. So, Eretz Shel is also Golis. You can be in Golis in Eretz Shel. Hanukkah was the story of the Greek Golis, and we weren't kicked out of Eretz Shel. So, there are Jews all over the world. We're not together. And even the people who are living together are not together. You know, there's, uh, I live in Harnof. And can I know her? People have large families. People are busy. Chavnish Kaintainis. A wonderful woman uh, by the name of Esther Yarmish lives in my building. And she's been working tirelessly to try to unite the community and bring everybody together. It's very hard. Someone said to me, you know, the, the, uh, if you know everybody in your building, you must be the Vad Bayit. No the head of the condo board who collects the, the, the money every month. You know? uh, there are people who cut through buildings and elevators, and not every building appreciates this because people abuse it. So this guy is waiting for the elevator, and someone says, uh, um, who are you visiting? He says, I've been living in the building for six months. The guy says, oh, uh, welcome. <laughs> you know... The only time people get, you know, interested in someone is if they're moving or dying because then they can get their apartment. You know, they want to know that it's available. <laughs> it's, uh, it's sad. We don't feel that sense of need. That's what Gullah says. Gullah says that we're separate. We are separate entities. We are split apart. Tisha B'Av is a time of ashes. You know, ashes don't join together. There's a din of being able to knead dirt to be able to make it into mud. You can't do that with ashes. Ashes are, by definition, separate particles. They have a past with no future. And Tisha B'Av, when we talk about a day of ashes, sitting in the ashes, taking the ashes and putting it on the egg, we're talking about total separation. That's what Golas is. And that's why the way we celebrate Tisha B'Av is alone. We sit down and eat the Sudam of Sekis by ourselves, off to the side, with, uh, you know, nobody else around. But Tisha B'Av is about being alone. It's, it's, it's about recognizing the fact that everything's been destroyed. It got broken on Shavas Batamas, but it got destroyed on Tisha B'Av. And therefore, in Shemona Esrei, to kab a shofar gadol, yeah, blow the shofar and bring everybody together. Uva of the merit hashor, the hani dachim eretz mitzrayim. Bring all of Klai Yisrael together. Then we can talk about building the base of Migdash and setting up the Sanhedrin and you know and having the goal. But first, we have to get everybody back together. And that's not easy. It's not easy. With Achtus, we can win the fight. As they said in the American Revolution, gentlemen, if we do not hang together, then we will surely hang separately. And if Klai Yisrael had a sense that I need everybody, there's, there's, there's a sense of desperation it's not that, it's not that uh, we're not fighting. But do I need you to be part of my life? Yeah, you see families. Everybody's living their own life. This one's going here, this one's going there, it's that. You have those families where everybody sits down together for supper. 
and they're, how was your day? And they all talk together, you know, but those are usually in Norman Rockwell paintings. Yeah, from family, this one's going off to Shear, this one's in Yeshiva, this one's going there, this one's going to a class, this one's busy there. You know, who, to, to, to be able to just focus on ourselves, that's as a family. It was a community. I grew up in North Merrick, Long Island. It was not a Jewish area. Merrick was a Jewish area. Yeah, it was, it was upper middle class and, uh, and Jewish. I lived in North Merrick. It was lower middle class and, um, and, uh, mostly Catholic. <laughs> Irish and Italian, for the most part. There were Jews there too. Um, but not many. Nonetheless, my street, all the houses on the street, it was like a, it was like a semicircle. It had to be 20, maybe 30 families. A few times a year, they'd have a block party. All the neighbors came out. They made a block party. Everybody brought a dish. Everybody put it on the table. Uh, they had music. They spoke. There's not that. It was amazing. Because we're, we're, this is our block. This is our block. We're, we're together. I have a sense of, a sense of responsibility. And then there's a sense of, of my neighborhood. And a sense of my city. A sense of my country. It's something bigger than me. And the more people are locked into themselves, I don't need anybody. I don't feel like I need anybody. I'm not a part of anything. That's gullus. That's the ultimate gullus is everything is all over the place. It's all in pieces. It's ashes. It's particles. You know, the famous Yerushalmi that everybody quotes. Yeah. So what does it mean, call Yisrael Revim Zelazah? If I'm cutting a piece of meat and I accidentally cut my left hand, it never occurs to my left hand to grab the knife and cut my right hand back. Because we know we're, we're one goof. So Klai Yisrael is supposed to be one organism. We're one being. We're one, we're one group. And that ideally is what we're supposed to have. I, uh, we have a men's shmir saloshim we do in Harnof. Uh, the week before Tisha B'Av. And I say over something almost every year. I try to say it over. You know, there's a panic of Tisha B'Av to make sure that I eat enough. And it's hard because it's milk. And you always feel like you're not full. So this year it's Shabbos. So okay. Yeah. But, uh, you know, another piece of lasagna, you know. Another piece of bread and, uh, and, and, and butter, another uh, cup of coffee, another piece of watermelon. You know, you're always nervous to the last minute. How much time have I got? Take another drink of water, you know? Because you can't eat or drink. But you know, you also can't greet. I always say, are you careful in Erev Tisha B'Av to say hello to people? Because I tell them, I'm not going to be able to say hello to you tomorrow. So I want to say hello to you today. Or we just focused on whether or not I'm going to be hungry and I'm going to be thirsty, but not whether or not I'm going to miss out on human interaction. I'm feeling good about Yiddish kite. With Achtus, we will win the fight. And that's why I'm so glad I started with that email because I feel like, you know, we, 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 we all come together. I'm just, you know, uh, one among all the other people who enjoy getting together uh, once a week and sharing ideas and sharing feelings. And, you know, we meet each other and it, it, it makes me feel so good that there's, that there's something that's bringing people together. Moshe Shapiro said to me, if you can do anything today that gives people chizik, you have to do it. And I know people get chizik from this, being able to come together. And if we bring everyone together, right? Kibbutz Goliath, that's the first step to the Gula. That comes first. First, we have to bring it together. The, the Gullis is separated, as Haman says. Yeah. 
I'm mefuzer mefurag ben amim. They're separated everywhere. There's no connection between them. So if we bring them together, then that's the power. And the sad thing is that the power of fire is that fire turns everything into fire. Fire brings everything together. I hope we can do that with just the fire of excitement. Because I'm feeling good about Yiddishkeit. And I'm feeling good about Yidin. And so we can bring them together with that fire of excitement. Then hopefully we won't need anything else. And that brings us to the question and answer uh, portion of our program. Okay, Anonymous asks, does the Rav listen to a cappella music during Svira or the three weeks? What music does the Rav listen to in general? So uh, um, the role of a cappella music is because there are people today who are addicted to music. I'm not of that generation. The isurim of playing music is because music leads to simcha. And, uh, and today, uh, when Thomas Edison came up with the, with the record player, and then the radio, and then the CD, and, yeah, and people can listen to music all the time. So no one knows how to go without it. I know people go to sleep with the music on. Because they can't, they can't handle not having music. So acapella music, I think, during the three weeks was developed because people can't go three weeks without listening to music. It's too hard for them. I, I, I can do without music. Yeah. Um, I don't have that same, I don't have that same need. I enjoy music. Uh, so what music do I like to listen to? Um, I don't know that I can give it a, uh, uh, a specific name, but it's uh, Lebedic uh, Jewish music. Um, music that when you listen to it, uh, uh, it just it makes you feel good, lifts you up. <laughs> you hear a tune like that. You know, or uh, music like that. You get the idea. <laughs> in fact, there's one beautiful song, which I, I want to turn it into a, uh, a short promo. Na 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 the Rabbi Olavsky show, uh, a jingle. It's a show, it's a show, it's not a sheer, it's a show, it's a show, it's a show, the only way to go, uh, it's a show, it's a, anyway, I don't know why, it just came to me in a moment of, of, of recognition, and I said, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so those are the kind of songs that I like to listen to, ones that pick you up. Yeah? Okay. Do you have a favorite way to refer to Hashem and why? Yeah, Hashem. Because it's, you know, it says it all. <laughs> Hashem, the name of Hashem. Yeah. Uh, in English, I say God. You know, uh, a lot of it is how you grow up. A lot of it is how you grow up. This is how I grew up. We said Hashem, we said God, and those are the ones. Anonymous asks, how can we stay motivated to go to sleep on time and wake up on time? Oh, boy. This is tough. This is tough. I'm a night person. Um, I'm number five of six boys. So uh, there's a nine-year gap between my oldest brother and me. So as a little kid, I was growing up, my parents worked very late, long hours, and so I was basically uh, hanging out with all these older kids. I was the only first, second grader that I know who watched Johnny Carson, which came on at 11.30 at night. And uh, I'm not a morning person. You know those people who are morning people? They get up at 5.30 in the morning or 6 o'clock in the morning, and it just comes naturally to them. I have to rip myself out of bed. <laughs> 
So let's start with getting up in the morning. Getting up in the morning, the way you have to do it is Ezul Chacham Arroyas and Say to yourself, how am I going to feel at 11 o'clock when I finally climb out of bed? Am I going to feel good about myself or bad about myself? And if you can tap into that feeling of how I feel, then you push yourself. Now, there was a takufa when I had to change this to get up in the morning. I would set like three different alarms. I always put them far away so you can't push the snooze. I have to get out of bed to turn them off. Yeah, And you have to reset your uh, your internal clock and help yourself get up. And if you are careful to get up every day and live a life, do stuff, you'll be tired at the end of the day. So put on your pajamas, get into bed, yeah? Find something that can uh, relax you. Me, I find the, for me personally, yeah, you know, one of the easiest things that I use as a technique when I'm I'm too tense to fall asleep is uh, I have uh, the New York Times crossword puzzle uh, books of them, and you start doing these clues, and it's too much brain power for late at night. It just knocks me right out. <laughs> so you have to make yourself a comfortable sleep environment, yeah, as much as you can. Jonathan M., why does Judaism have so little to say about big issues facing the world today, such as gender dysphoria or LGBTQ issues? Does Judaism have a place for this large community? Okay. Judaism has something to say about every big issue facing the world today and forever. Gender dysphoria is not one of them. It is 0.0 something percent of people who suffer from gender dysphoria. Now, the number has gone up in recent years. Why? Because of all the attention that was given to it. Until that point, boys who thought they were girls and girls who thought they were boys was less than a fraction of 1% of the population. And the fact that we turned it around that somehow they're a major force in the world is because we are crazy. It's crazy. And people suffer from gender dysphoria, which until very, very recently was recognized as a condition that needs to be treated to help these people go on and live meaningful lives. Now it's embraced Now the government embraces it. Now they encourage it in school to teach your children. Maybe you're a girl, maybe you're a boy, maybe the opposite, and confuse everybody for what? Yes, little boys are sometimes dressed up like girls, and little girls are sometimes dressed up like boys. Yes, so what? Sometimes they think they're an astronaut. Sometimes they think they're a fireman. So now we have to develop fireman affirmation care for these kids? Make sure that they they can embrace their fireman or their astronaut side? No. It's a little kid. They have imaginations. They play. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's crazy. It's just crazy. I'm sorry. I know this is not politically correct, but hey, welcome to the club. That's what we're about here. So they suddenly turn it into a major thing. So what about the LGBTQ community? So the Torah deals with it. Yeah? Homosexuality is usser. Period. You have a taiva? Hey, welcome to the club. Many, many people have a taiva for adultery. They see a pretty lady just because she gets married. You know, they still think she's a pretty lady. The fact that you have a taiva, you have a taiva. But the Torah says, don't act on every taiva. You can't eat everything. You can't sleep with everyone. You can't do everything. You're right. That's what Judaism has to say. This is not right. And we're not embarrassed to say it. So a person says, well, you know. So they have a gay parade. A a, a gay pride parade. What are you proud of? What is it to be proud of? Because I like this kind of a person. So so we're going to have a blonde parade? You like blondes? So let's have a parade. Everybody likes blondes. 
Let's have a, uh, a straight parade. I wonder how that would go over. I am straight pride. I'm proud that I like to be married to a regular person in a regular marriage in a regular situation. Could you imagine if they had a parade? What would they say if there was such a parade? Oh, it's, it's anti this and that. Why? How come it's okay for you to flaunt your personal choices and it's not right for anybody else to, pla- for, to flaunt their personal choices? The answer is there's nothing to be proud of. There's not pride. Yeah? You decide you like this person? Okay. So you say, well, I don't want to be thrown out of my apartment. Okay. So I don't want to be fired. Okay. But you should march through the streets and demand that everybody recognize your decision as legitimate? No, we are not going to. The Torah says it's wrong. So, okay. So you love people. People who make mistakes. But I don't have to turn around and say to uh, 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 a boy who thinks he's a girl, that he's a girl. He's not. He's a boy. But he really thinks he is. Okay. Okay, so this uh, this guy over there thinks he's Napoleon Bonaparte, but he's not. There's facts. There's reality. Judaism is very big on reality. That's what Judaism has to say on the topic. And the fact that there's this craziness in society because there's a desire to break down everything. And I alluded to this in the Shavas Batamu's uh, Shir. I did it in a more oblique manner. But since all the cards are on the table, I'll put it right out there. We think this is wrong and we think this is destructive for society and we condemn that lifestyle. I'm not going to condemn the people. But no, I'm not going to say eating treif is good. I'm not going to say being Mechal Shabbos is good. And I'm not going to say that this kind of a lifestyle is good. So people say to me, you know, uh, well, why does the Torah frown upon it? I said, because God gave the Torah and God said you won't find your fulfillment this way. You don't believe in God. You don't believe in Torah. Do what you want. You have a problem with a brother and sister getting married? Why? Who says that's wrong? How about a parent and a child? You okay with that? I mean, we're, we're just, we're just right next to that now anyway. When was that there, that point? You know, we, we break down mamish any barrier that there is. And the last time we broke down all of the barriers, it was a historical occurrence. It was called the Mabal. What happens when you break down all the barriers? So a good Baruch who breaks down the entire world and it all turns to mud. God set up the world with certain barriers. And if people don't like it, that doesn't change the reality. I got from the early 1970s when everybody was apologetic. All of Judaism was apologetic. And everyone said, well, the Torah says this, and it fits in with that, and it could fit in with something that. Anyway, my Rebbe, who was Makar of me, Rabbi Yaakov Well. Yeah, when I was 12 years old, he came in and said, this is what the Torah says, and if you don't like it, it's still what the Torah says. And I was outraged. And I fought with him, and I said, my goodness, this guy is right. This really upsets my worldview. And all everybody else in my class said, ignore him. Who cares if he's right? But there's right and there's wrong, and that's what makes a Jew. And if you can't tell the difference between what's right and what's wrong, what's true and what's false, what's good and what's evil, then there is no Judaism. You don't make Judaism to fit you. I always love when I hear these people say things like, well, God would never... I I don't believe that God would... Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. You're a prophet? You're in in a personal connection with him? Or you're saying, a voter Zorah means I have to make God fit in with my image of him. Yeah, I'll make a God in my image. That's called a voter Zorah. So I'm sure God would never reject the, uh, the LGBTQ lifestyle. Based on what? How about the fact that he wrote in the Torah? Yeah? Uh, you don't believe in the Torah? Okay, so don't talk about Judaism. If you reject God and you reject Torah, so then what do you, who cares what you think? So come up with your own religion. It's called the Vodah Zorah. But don't try to take it and stick it into Judaism. Don't say, well, Judaism has to, no, it does not. It says there's a boy and there's a girl. Now there is something called a, uh, androgynous. 
They have male and female characteristics, and the halacha discusses what to do it. But that is a, a, a difficulty in nature, where, where according to one shita, it's a brib if they atzmo. It's it's nothing. It's its own creature, something that's been created that's totally out. But you would take that and use it as a basis to be able to develop an entire philosophy on life. Doesn't make any sense. Um, I'm sorry if I came on a little strong about this, but I just, when you watch the world go crazy, there's got to be somebody. And I always said, I'm the little boy who notices that the, that the king has no clothes. And, and this, this, uh, this focus on less than a, a fraction of 1% of the population and, and trying to make this somehow normative. Sorry. Sorry. Not on my watch. Well, anyway, I, I didn't, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I never like to speak in strong terms. I'm so easygoing. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> anyway, that's it for this show. Uh, if you want to find out more about the show, you can go to my website, rabbialowski.com. You can make a comment. You can sponsor an episode. Uh, you can uh, download the, uh, the uh, theme song, someone just asked me recently where I can get the theme song. I said, go to the website. It's over there. Um, you can uh, uh, see other shiurim that I have. Uh, you can access so much material, so many exciting and fun things. And uh, that's it until next time. I am David Olavsky, and this has been the Rabbi Olavsky Show. <laughs>